As I'm sure you're all aware, this uh, today happens to be the exactly two months since the uh, terrorist attack that took place in southern Israel on, the, on October the 7th. We are, of course, still uh, in many ways living that and uh, still thinking about that. Still, um, that day hasn't ended in a certain way, certainly for the hostages, the Israelis who are still held captive in the Gaza Strip, um, but also for the survivors of that attack, the families, for every Israeli, and indeed, I really think for many Jews around the world who have been uh, deeply affected, uh, many of them very personally affected by what took place on that day. Um, since then, sadly, we've also heard um, some attempts to deny the atrocities that were committed by Hamas and others on, on that day. Uh, to claim that they uh, were fake, that it's fake news, or even that Israel itself uh, committed some of these atrocities. Um, and that kind of denialism is shocking and disgraceful, um, wherever, it's, uh, wherever it's coming from or for whatever reason. Um, it doesn't matter what your view is about the rights and wrongs of the current war, or your views about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or your attitudes towards Palestinians, you can still, in fact, you must acknowledge the facts of what happened on that day, on October the 7th, the facts that atrocities were committed. This is not a, a pro-Israel position. This is a pro-human position. This is a pro-truth position. Uh, it's very important to recognize that, and I think it's very, very important for us to hear from the survivors themselves. Um, and so I... Um, I'm very, very honored and, and very, very grateful uh, that we have this opportunity today. Uh, and um, I want to thank Shai for, for coming here today. I can't imagine how difficult it must be uh, to have to recount the trauma of what you've gone through. And I really want to thank you for coming and sharing your, your story with us today. So uh, Shai Klein-Weinstein is a 26-year-old photographer uh, living in Tel Aviv, he survived the uh, October 7th terrorist attack while attending the uh, Supernova Music Festival. I think around 300 people, 3, well, 300 people were slaughtered uh, at that festival. 364. Um, so this is, you know, when you and when I heard about that that music festival in particular, this is the kind of thing some of you might have been attending. Um, Shai himself is originally from Toronto, Canada. He, was, he visited his family in Israel last spring, moved to Israel just six months, six months ago, um, and um, he's now traveling across, the North, across North America to share his experience with us. So uh, again, I want to thank you. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want you to listen. I'm sure what we're going to hear is going to be upsetting and disturbing. I think it is important for us to, to hear, to listen and take, take in, and uh, I hope also to share what you've heard uh, beyond outside of this room as well. So without any further ado, thank you, Shai. Thank you very much for having me here. I appreciate it, and I appreciate every one of you for being here to see and hear and witness what I have to share with you today, as difficult as it is. As I was introduced, my name is Shai Klein-Weinstein, and I'm from Toronto, Canada. This past April, I went to Israel on vacation to visit my family, and I decided to stay and make Aliyah. I made my Aliyah in June. I've been there less than a year. On October 7th, myself, my cousin, and several friends went to the Supernova Music Festival. This would be my first ever music festival. How many of you have been to a music festival? So you remember what it was like your first time. You remember who you were with. You remember the DJs or the bands that were playing, what you felt, approaching, getting there, how the eagerness, the joy, the excitement, the adrenaline, the nervousness maybe. You remember the people you met there, the friends you made. You remember 
finishing the festival and going home and talking about how amazing it was and texting or calling the people you met there and saying, wow, I'm so glad I met you, let's make plans, let's do it again, let's go on another one, whatever. Very similar to how mine was. It was the exact same feelings that I felt. Initially, I didn't want to go. I had no intention of going. I had never been to a music festival. Prior to moving to Israel, I had never even been to a party or a club or a bar or a rave or anything like that. My conception of a music festival would be dirty, gross, <laughs> people I don't like, music I don't like, standing there dancing or trying to dance for six and a half hours, 12 hours, waiting to go home just so I can sleep and eat and be done with it. But that was not the case. That was October 7th, the Supernova Music Festival, up until 6 a.m. was some of the most fun that I had ever had since moving to Israel. And I'm glad that I went. I only bought my ticket prior because a good friend of mine, she was deliberating whether or not she would go. And I told her, if you're going to go, I'll go. And we bought our tickets together within a 24-hour window before the festival. We went to a friend's birthday, and then from the friend's birthday that night, we went to the music festival, arriving there at around 1.55 a.m. It was supposed to end 4 in the afternoon that Saturday, an overnight festival. And getting to the music festival, right away, we're met with the lights. We're met with the sounds, the heavy bass coming from the stage as we drive up. Rows and rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of cars in the parking lot. Now, arriving to the festival only took us an hour. Arriving to the festival, it was my cousin, Mordecai, in his car with his girlfriend, Tamara, Yael, and Ellie myself in a separate car with a friend of ours, Doraz. We get to the festival ground and we see this, we hear this, we see the lights and we're getting more and more pumped as we approach. I'm starting to realize I'm actually excited and I'm not just waiting to go home. We get our things out of the car, we go to the lineup, it's huge, we meet our friends, I see my cousin, we say, hey, what's up, we get ready, we get to the security, get our wristbands. The security is armed. They're not soldiers, they're security, but they're armed, they have handguns, they have machine guns, but they're not soldiers, it's not IDF protecting us. We get through the security, we get our wristbands, we enter the festival ground, the entrance, the entrance to the festival ground were the camps, the canteens, where everyone's set up, you get the pathways in between, forwards and then to the left, towards the festival ground, and each path in between the paths, with all the trees, illuminated by yellow string lights, are all the camps, you see, People laughing, smiling, hugging, kissing, joking around. An incredibly positive environment. You can tell everybody's having fun. Everyone's having a good time. Nobody's not having fun, and if they are, it's probably because they're taking a nap. <laughs> so we meet our two friends who are already there waiting for us. So it's a total of eight of us in our group. My friend Barak and his girlfriend Almog are waiting. They have the camp set up. We bring in our stuff, we join them, we get our things situated, we take a minute to breathe, get ourselves in the mindset for dancing for the whole night. And we're like, okay, let's go. We make it into the festival ground. Immediately we're met with the site, the main stage, to our right, a huge Buddha statue, maybe you've seen it, huge Buddha statue, psychedelic canopy, and then the bass going and people yelling and shouting and having fun, and then off to the left, in the back of the festival ground, there's the smaller stage, the mushroom stage, mushroom because you know it's the smaller stage. And then in between, you got the bar here, the bar there. You have an arts tent way in the back. You have a market for people to sell their belongings, whether it's bags, shirts, shoes, jewelry, tops, whatever, party wear, festival wear. And then you have a safe zone towards the back, to the left of the porta potties. It's an area you can go, take yourself out of it. If you drank too much, took too much, didn't feel safe, or too tired, you just wanted a break, you wanted to socialize, anything like that, that's where you go. There or your camps. And this is what it was like. So that was filmed around 5 a.m., just sun break, right before 6. So, if you've ever partied with Israelis, 
you know, as a North American, it's hard to keep up. <laughs> it's in their blood. I'm Canadian. I'm from Toronto, and like I just said before, I had never even been to a party before going to Israel. They ruined me. <laughs> I can't dance for six and a half hours without having to take a break. I'm not a big drinker. The whole night I had one beer. So we all go there, get our beers, go to the main, go to the small stage, spend like two hours there. We're bored. We go to the main stage where the good DJs are, and that's where we spend the rest of our night. As the night progresses, obviously. I need to take a break. I need to walk around. I need to get a breather. I'm not able to just go for five hours without stopping. I tell my cousin, I'll bring you guys a beer. I'm going to go around, walk around, meet people, take photos, because I have my camera with me. This is a first for me, so I have my camera to take photos of something that I want to remember. I make my way towards what looks like a place to get coffee. It's like a little booth. You can sit down, rest, get coffee, hang around. That's where I meet Dor and his girlfriend, Lali. Dorman's girlfriend were not there just having fun at the festival. Lali was there just as an attendee, but Dor was there working. He's a masseuse. He had a booth. He was giving people massages at the festival, something you could really use after dancing for six and a half hours. I only approached Dor because I saw his fuzzy white coat and I thought he looks like a cool guy. And he absolutely was. I introduced myself. I say, hey, I like your coat. You guys look really nice. Do you mind if I get your photo? More than happy to let me take their photo. We talk a little bit. That's when I learned what he's doing there. I snap the photo. I say goodbye. I'll see you guys around. We'll dance to you. I'll, I'll come meet you. I'll come get a massage, whatever. I say bye, and I make my way further into the festival ground. I go to the market because maybe I want to spend some money. I don't. I meet Shai and Dor. My conversation with Shai was very short, mostly consisting of our shared name. Dor, who spoke mostly about what he was doing at the festival, he was there selling jewelry that his brother made. His brother and himself, they worked together. His brother made the jewelry that he sold, and he sold it. He attended these festivals, these events, doing this thing with his brother. Typically, his brother attends with him, but he was not there that day. I asked him how many times he's done this, how many festivals, events, so on and so forth. He's done it several years. He liked to make music, he's a DJ, he plays guitar. This is his scene. I'm new to it, so I'm obviously trying to get some advice out of him in order to survive. I make my way to the arts tent in the back of the festival because I'm a photographer, I'm an artist. This is absolutely the place that I can meet like-minded people, and I was totally right. I met Jessica, who's a phenomenal tattoo artist. She lives right near my grandparents talk about that. She was painting a canvas at the festival. I meet Jesse and Itamar. Itamar is an incredible graphic designer and artist. Jesse works in mental health care. I introduce myself, say you guys look really nice. You're super photogenic. You look awesome. Let me take your photos. The photos are not amazing, but the people are, so I'm happy with them regardless. I get their social medias. All these people, I get their social media, their contact, whatever. I'll send it to you after the festival. We'll meet up. I'll print the photos. I'll send them to you. Whatever you want. I'll come around again, I'll say hi later on. I say goodbye, and I carry on. As I'm walking around the festival ground, I'm stopped. I see, I meet Shani, Noah, and Arik, and I just want their photo taken, and I'm more than happy to take their photo because they look like they're having the time of their life. And this is my friend Barak and his girlfriend Almod. Barak and my cousin Mordecai, they're very big in the psychedelic trance music scene. This is their thing. They're responsible for whatever mess we get ourselves into at any party. And this wouldn't happen without Mordecai and Vara having organized it, and I'm very glad that they did. This photo is taken around 5 a.m., around the same time as that first video. This is Itamar, and I only took his photo because I really liked his sweater. That's it. I introduce myself, I compliment his sweater, I ask him to take his photo. He's a bit apprehensive at first. He's like, oh, you know, I'm not photogenic. No one takes good photos of me. Same thing that many of you probably say. I'm like, that's not true. I'll take your photo, you'll look hot. I take his photo, I get his contact information. I tell him, I'll see you around, and I carry on. Now it's getting, now, it, now it's a bit different. So now, I'm walking around the festival ground, I finish taking whatever photos, I finish talking to people, and I get a text. My friends, my cousin, Barak, Almog, Dolraz, Yael, 
They're all going to the camp area to take a little bit of a breather, to get some rest, to have a bit of fun just amongst themselves. I tell them, okay, I'll join you in a bit. My friend Ellie texts me. She's waiting for me at the main stage. So I say, okay, I'm heading over to you now, and we'll go back to the others together. I go to Ellie. I'm looking for her. Now, the festival had a capacity of 4,000. That's the most that could have possibly been there, but there was 3,500 there. Now, when you're in a huge crowd, everyone's dancing, it's late at night, and everyone's jumping up around each other, and you're looking for a woman who's about this tall. It's pretty hard. I'm looking for her, I'm looking for her, I can't find her, I hop on a FaceTime call, I'm like, I'm by these speakers, where are you? She says the same, I'm by these speakers, where are you? A back and forth like that for a few minutes, and then I find her. It's not because I looked really hard, it's not because she found me, or somebody said, here she is. It's because 6.30 comes along, and that's when the first rockets are intercepted overhead. Who? Who here has been to Israel? Who here has had rockets fired at them? So when the rockets come, what do you do? You go to the mamad, you go to the bunker, you wait 15 minutes, and you go about your day. It's inconvenient at best. It's a bad day if the shrapnel lands on your car. There's no mamad. We're in the Negev desert. There's no bunker, there's no mamad, there's no miklat, there's no stairwell, there's no door frame, there's no bathtub, there's nothing. There's sand, dirt, hippies, and trees. Rockets, 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 5, 10, 15, 20, hundreds of rockets, hundreds more. When you see rockets on Instagram, you see the Iron Dome intercept them, and it goes, and you go, wow, that's crazy. What you don't get is the 15 second delay between seeing the explosion and hearing the explosion and then feeling the air around your body shaking. We were so close, there was no delay. Boom, 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 boom. One after the other, after the other, after the other. The air vibrating around us. Music stops, people take a pause, everyone looks at the sky, sees the rockets. The DJ says, you know, rockets, everyone get down, cover your heads, go to your friends, leave, so on and so forth. The party's over. People start leaving right away. People are leaving. No one's running for their life. No one's dying. No one's terrified. I'm sure people are scared. But it's not because they think they're about to die. It's not because they think something else is coming. It's not because it's rockets. Nobody wants to be a few hundred meters below rockets exploding their heads. So I make we all make our way back to our friends. I come around Ellie, I like I drag her along because there's confusion. Everyone's nervous. There's an overwhelming sense of anxiety among everybody. We make it to our camp where my friend Yael and Doraz and Mordecai and Tamara and everybody's there. My cousin's sitting down. Yael is on her phone. She's reading names. Ramat Gan, Herzliya, Tel Aviv, Petah Tikva, Starot, Natibot. Names of cities. There's the red alert going off. Names of cities where rockets are striking. Rishon Zion, so on and so forth. Lots and lots and lots and lots of cities, lots and lots and lots of names. I'm not used to rockets. I'm not born in Israel. I'm not raised with rockets. My first experience with rockets was on Tel Aviv Beach. Rockets fired at us from Gaza over Yafo. I stand up. I tell my friend, should we leave? Where do we go? Where's the nearest bunker? She says, wait a second. And we look at the rockets. We see them go caught by the Iron Dome. And she says, no, we stay. That's my first experience with rockets. But immediately, one rocket, 100, 1,000, whatever, I'm on edge. I'm uncomfortable. I feel like I can see and hear everything. I tell my friends immediately, I want to leave. Let's go. Yeah, everyone thinks it's fine. Really fine. It's over. It's, the part is over. The part is over, even if we don't want it to be. Nothing is continuing after this. Did you? Are you stay? Are you saying stay because it's safer? No. no I'm saying, they don't shoot it. Everybody's gonna shoot it. Nothing is safer. You, you don't have a safer from here. No, of course, of course. Well, I wasn't. Anyway, so we are now in big danger.
But I'm just saying, like, there's no reason because the festival's not continuing after this. So maybe we might as well just start packing up. Unfortunately. No, I mean, there's no rush because let everybody. Oh, because everyone's rushing out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I understand. There's no danger, they're not firing at us, there's no rush. Why would we think we're in danger? We're right next to where the rockets are coming from. They're definitely not aiming at this patch of desert. They're shooting over us to the cities away from us. That's what we think. We don't know what's happening. We think it's just rockets. Wow, they have a lot this time. Not much conversation happens after, and there was no back and forth really, there's no arguing. I say I want to leave, I think we should go now. Whether we leave now, or in half an hour, or an hour, we're still going to be in traffic, we're going to be in the same situation, so let's pack up and get in the middle of it. Okay, so we start to pack up and go. There's eight of us there. We have a tent, we have a canopy, we have a couple of chairs, yoga mats, and then our bag, and that's it. You don't need eight people to pack up what we have. I tell my cousin, well you guys are going to take the time you take to pack up our things. I'm going to go, I'm going to help some other people pack up their things, I'm going to take some more photos, and we'll go. I think I'm going to take some photos because I'm looking around, and I'm seeing people, they're still smiling, they're still having fun, they're still joking around. The party's over, people know the party's over, because people are already leaving. They're leaving the festival, they're going to their cars, and they're leaving. I think it's really interesting to see people all smiles and singing and laughing and joking with their friends, with the chaos around them of people rushing to leave. I meet Ori and Yvegni singing the national anthem, making themselves breakfast. I introduce myself, ask if they need a hand with anything. They don't. Ask if I can take their photo. And as you can see, they're absolutely happy to have it taken. I don't bother getting their contact information because it's not what I'm thinking of at this moment. I say goodbye if you guys need a hand. I'll be able to walk by again. I right, carry on. I mean, Odea and Itay. Odea was part of the security. She was unarmed. She was just there, I presume, to make sure we stayed safe amongst ourselves, not drinking too much, taking too much, harming <coughs> each other, anything like that. She was helping Itay close his canopy, as you can see in the photo. I gave them a hand because they were struggling. I say, you mind if I take your photo? And they're happy to have your photo taken. Two strangers, not friends or anything like that. They don't even know each other. Goodbye, I'll see you around, get home safe, blah blah blah. And I carry on. I meet many other people and I take their photos and I carry on. And I head back to my friends. You can see my cousin Mordecai, this time with a shirt. <laughs> Next to him in the hammock. This guy was in the hammock the whole time. He did not leave the hammock except for when I told him to so I could take his photo. I said I told him to but I asked insistently. He wasn't anxious, he wasn't nervous, he wasn't scared, he wasn't sweating, nothing of the like, nothing even adjacent to those words I just gave you. The only time he stood up, like I said, is when I asked him to, to take his photo. He told us his name is Ran, he told us he's very experienced with these festivals, this isn't his first or his 15th or his 20th, he's been going to these festivals when he was my age. We asked him where he's from, he said he's from my local kibbutz, we asked him what it was like to the kibbutz. He said it was nice, it's quiet. His kibbutz had a lot of young people. He lived in kibbutz Beiri, near the festival ground. I had never been there, I don't even know where it was. He gave us an open invitation for dinner. We get our things packed up and now we're ready to go. We say goodbye to Ran, goodbye to whoever is around us we were talking to. Now we're ready to leave. We get our things. And as I'm getting back, actually, from taking the photos before we leave, I hear a sound in the distance, really far away, not within the festival ground, because if it was, I think everybody would have heard it. I hear a sound that's very sharp, that's very fast, and that's very short-lived. A sound I can only attribute to machine gun fire. Now, I asked my cousin if he heard this, I asked my friends if they heard this, I asked Ran if he heard this, and nobody was sure or they didn't hear anything. There's a lot of commotion going on. But I heard the sound and it made me feel sick. It made me want to leave even more than ever before. I wanted to leave now. I've never heard a gunfire in my life. I lived in Canada, I lived in Toronto, Canada, I lived in North Ontario, 
an hour away from Toronto. There's a lot of people with guns, but not just shooting them around hunting and stuff like that. Only time I've heard guns is in Call of Duty and movies. But I heard this sound, and I knew it was a gun being fired. I just knew. It wasn't coming from anything within the festival ground, not a car, not a DJ, not a speaker, nothing. And thank God, because we're leaving. We make our way to the parking lot, which is not even 50 meters away. It's right over the side of the fence, which was pushed over so people could leave easier. Our car is very close. We make our way to the parking lot. It's already starting to empty. People are leaving. Again, no one's fleeing in terror. No one's running for their life. Nobody's scared they're going to die. People are uncomfortable. People are nervous. I'm sure there are some people that are scared, but again, it's just because of the overall situation. It's not because there's gunmen killing us yet. Yes. It's here we meet Moti. Moti was a very nice guy. He was going around asking people if they're okay to drive, if they're sober, if they need anything, if you need water, do you have all your things, do you want to ride, stuff like that. You can see my fucking handle by the way. Shy? You're driving? Yeah. 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 I'm absolutely okay to drive. Good. You need water or something? We have we have water. Thank you very much. We pack up our things, we say goodbye to Moti, we're ready to go. The bus in the background of the video there, that's the bus Moti came on. And it was actually driven by a Palestinian from Gaza. So now we're ready to go, our stuff is packed up, we're ready to load ourselves up. I'm driving because I'm the most sober. Believe it or not, I had a single beer that whole night. I'm not a big drinker. Before we get a chance to load ourselves into the car, that's when we hear gunfire erupt from the festival ground. All of us hear it very clearly, the sound of sustained machine gun fire. Now, I want to mention, at this time, now we don't see any security. All the security has moved from where the camp area is into the festival ground before the gunfire started. So I have no doubt whatsoever that much of the gunfire we heard was them shooting back. But I know for a fact a lot of it wasn't. We all hear the gunfire start. We hear the screaming. We hear the panic. We see people now running for their lives. We hear people yelling terrorists. We have to leave. We all give each other horrified looks. I throw my phone in the car. We climb in. Yeah, let's go. Myself, my cousin Mordecai, his girlfriend Tamara, Yael, and Ellie, the five of us, in this little crappy four-door sedan. Our other three friends, Barak, Doraz, and Almog, somewhere else, at their own car. We don't get a chance to say goodbye. We don't say, let's meet you here, we'll see you at home, whatever. We all just focus on getting out. I get in the car, and I fly down the dirt road of the parking lot. It's not paved or anything. This is a dirt area. People are parking their cars there. We make our way towards the exit, one of two exits. Basically mirror images on both sides. Exit, main road, farm, field, opposite, on both sides. The exit we went to, we go towards it. Cars, 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 cars. Parallel to one another, front and back. Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of cars. Everyone trying to get out at the same time. If you've ever lost a festival, or a concert, or a sporting event, it's painfully slow, as is. Even more so when people are now running for their life. And I look at all these cars, I look at all this traffic, now knowing there's gunfire and something going on around us, and I think, screw this. I tell my cousin Mordecai, I'm not waiting for all these people. I'm not waiting to see what's going to happen. I don't care about these people. I don't know them. They're not in my car. I'm not driving them. I want to leave now. And he says to me, well, you have to care about them. They're your brothers and your sisters. I don't respond. But I think to myself, you can't do anything for your brothers and your sisters or your friends if you're dead. So I make the decision without even asking. I just drive off the road. I drive off the dirt path onto the rocky terrain of the Negev Desert. Around shrubs, around trees, around bushes, around rocks. Past everybody. I don't care. I want to leave. If they want to wait in traffic, they can do that. I pass everybody towards the exit as close as I can. I see the road. I see a steep embankment on the left. Can't drive off of it because our car just won't let us. Now we're stuck, not by choice, behind two other cars. The guy in front of us is honking his horn and inching forwards like you do when you're stuck in traffic and the guy won't move. 
I'm white knuckling the steering wheel and my eyes are right up against it and I'm looking around and I'm starting to notice something. I'm starting to notice one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Some of these cars are now empty. They've been abandoned. They're not even on. Or they're on and there's no one in them. The car in front of us, like I said, they were honking, they were trying to go. I look through their windshield into the car ahead of them, and I see it's not even on. It's empty. There's no one in it. It's a dead car. I tell this to my cousin. I said, Mordecai, that car in front of them is dead. It's not moving. They're waiting for nothing, and we're stuck behind them waiting for nothing. We're bumper to bumper. I can't even get us around to go around anything. You have to get out knock on their window and tell them the situation because they have enough room to move and drive around. And if they do that, then we can leave and so can everyone behind us. And that's what he does. He gets out, knocks on the window, tells them what's up, and they drive around. They drive around the car, up the hill, and they go. Who knows where. Now we can leave. Drive past them. Now we're on the road. I look to my right, which is further south, although I don't know it at the time. Look to my right, and I see everybody going that way. Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of cars. I think, great, more traffic. I don't want to go there. I look to my left, can't go there either. Blocked by security forces and police. I don't know why. None of us knows why. Presently, I know it's because that's the direction of Kibbutz Be'eri, where Hamas was massacring half the population, burning people alive in their homes. Can't go that way. The only other option is for us to drive straight into an empty, dusty, barren field with nothing in it but other cars and people who have fled for their lives. So that's what we do. We drive, <coughs> I drive us straight ahead into this empty, dusty, barren field. And before we make it 50 meters into this field, Tamara, my cousin's girlfriend from the backseat, screams bloody murder, screams for us to leave the car. She doesn't say, okay guys, time to leave. She screams, Mordecai, shy, Ellie, everyone run, run, get out now, go, 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 everyone run, 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 shoot because people are being shot at, they're shooting at us. If you've ever been shot at, you know the bullets are at you, you know the bullets are aimed at your direction, you hear them flying by, you hear them hitting the ground, you know you're being shot at. There isn't a guy standing 50 meters behind us looking at our car specifically and shooting us, because then we'd be dead. But everybody around us, and us, we're all being shot at, and we don't want to be stuck in a little metal box. So we all leave, we leave the car, we flee on foot, we run into this dusty, empty, barren field, because there's nowhere else to go. My friend Ellie and I are the fastest, we're in the front, she's in front of me. I remember she's running ahead of me, and I, I say to her, don't run too fast or you'll trip. And I say we should get down low to the ground and cower so we're not shot. That's what we do. We get down, I'm holding on to her so tight I think I might hurt her, my back to the festival. I look behind us, I see my cousin's girlfriend Tamara and Yael doing the same thing, cowering down low to the ground to avoid being shot. And I'm looking for my cousin, and I see him, I see the back of his head. I see the back of his head as he runs back to our car, because the way we left it, it was forcing people to either stop or slow down or have to go around it as they were fleeing for their lives like we had. He gets the car, comes, picks us up. Now he's driving and I'm in the passenger seat. There's nothing for me to do. I can help navigate, look for a way out, and I can film and take photos, which I did. I didn't stop for any reason. I thought, I'm going to film, I'm going to take photos, because God forbid we die, at least as proof. So now we're driving around. Now we're back in gridlock, because so many people had the same idea. So many people fled into the exact same field as we have. Everybody looking at one another, exchanging confused looks. Not sure how to express oneself through a facial expression when you lock eyes with somebody else fleeing from terrorists. Like Orr and his friend here. We're driving around looking for a way to go and it doesn't look like there is one. Where are we going? No one has a clue. From one field to another. So dusty you can't see. Windows becoming beige. So hot in the car from our heavy breathing and our panic and just the overall environment. It's hard to breathe, we're like suffocating. We open the windows to catch a breath of air. Still suffocating because now it fills with dust and our mouths are dry and our noses are blocked. Our snot black. Alternating between opening and closing the windows. Unable to breathe for two different reasons when we do each. 
after driving for what felt like hours, I spot off in the distance what looks like a road. I can't see it's a road. What I see is an orange grove. I see a field and trees. I see trees, 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 and a space. Trees, 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 trees. If you've ever been on a farm, you know they have roads connecting them for the farm equipment to maintain them, harvest the crops. That's what I had hoped it was. I hoped maybe they didn't just do a bad job planting these trees. I thought I was going to drive towards it. And that's what we do. What's your phone battery at? So use your phone as little as possible. Can you blame them? Yes, yes, yes. We're just driving in circles. Ah, where are I'm watching those people over there. Yeah. Yes, that is a road. Yeah, I love the vibe, lad. Windows closed. No, I don't think more than the sounds. Slide down in your seats. Tomorrow, slide back down. What's the. Morty, can you answer this? What's the nearest border that they could be coming from? Right now, we're going east. Every time we pass a row of trees, I think there's men waiting, hiding within them, waiting to shoot us. And there is men in the fields all around us, waiting for people like us, fleeing for their lives, waiting for them to shoot them and kill them. Just not us at that time. 
as we're driving down this field, through the path, around blind corners, rockets overhead. Every time we turn a blind corner, I think there's men waiting to kill us. We drive into the next field over, and we see people going to the opposite end, and there's a gravel road there. And we follow that road as well. Two cars in front of us. Going around more blind corners, up and down hills. Again, thinking this man waiting to kill us. One of the cars peels off to the right, and they hide behind a warehouse. The other car keeps going straight. We pass by two tie workers and bicycles. We invite them into our car, and they ignore us. We make it to a main road. And the car in front of us turns right, as do we. And then they decide to turn around. They make a U-turn, and they wait for us to do the same. And we start to. But then my cousin and I, we realized this is back the direction of the festival that we had just come from. So we stop our U-turn, and we continue the way we were initially going. Driving down this forested road, other civilian cars passing us, going this way. Who knows why? My cousin honking the horn and waving for them to turn around because they don't know what's going on that way, presumably. Every time a car approaches us, I think there's men inside of it waiting to shoot us. Every time a car approaches us and my cousin's honking his horn, and I think he's going to draw attention to us and get us killed, but I don't say anything because it's not worth mentioning in this situation. And now we're approaching the city of Netivot. Now we're starting to see crashed cars. Now we're starting to see abandoned cars. Now we're starting to see cars riddled with bullets, rockets overhead. We come to an intersection and we think there's a checkpoint. We had already reached two checkpoints, and the first thing each checkpoint asks us, are you Israeli? Where are you going? It's the same answer every checkpoint. Yes, we're Israeli, we're going to Tel Aviv, blah, 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 this is the situation we left, it's horrible running for our lives, they let us through. Some of the checkpoints, they even aim their guns at me, because I have my camera strapped around my neck, my film camera, I have to stick it out the window so they can see it's not a gun. When we get to this intersection where we think there's a checkpoint, only to realize it is not, in fact, the checkpoint. Cars around it, abandoned, and riddled with bullets. It's not a checkpoint. It's just IDF Border Patrol there helping people. There's a, a member of the press reporting to a camera out of his trunk. Lots and lots of cars parked along the side of the road. An ambulance and ambulance workers surrounding someone on the ground a bunker with people peering out of it. And we come up to this supposed checkpoint before we realize it is not one. And I tell my cousin, drive over the median and drive past all of it, because if it is in fact a checkpoint, they'll stop us. There are soldiers and they have guns and we're not. That's something they'll have no problem doing. So that's what we do. We drive by and we carry on. No one stops us. Driving past Netivot towards Starot, more crashed cars, more abandoned cars, more cars riddled with bullets with bodies inside them, losing our minds every time we see one. Driving down the highway, one of the first few things we notice black pillars of smoke all around us. We don't know what it is, we see something's on fire somewhere. We don't realize these smoke plumes are from all the local kibbutz, 
and the house is being set on fire with people still in them. One of the first cars I notice on the highway is a silver car facing us on the shoulder of the road with the driver dead in the seat, shot in the face. And I see this very clearly. The whole time I'm telling the girls in their back to keep their heads down between their legs in case we're shot. I'm telling my cousin to keep his head low in case we're shot. Me still filming and taking photos the whole time, helping navigate my cousin's girlfriend as well. We're driving down this road, more abandoned cars with bodies in them, bodies on the ground behind them, belongings all over, riddled with bullets. 200 or so meters later, another silver car on the side of the road. Uh, this one has people next to it. There's two figures, and they're moving. And they're waving their arms around. They're doing this. And they're doing this, as if they want us to stop or slow down. And we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And now we can see them very clearly. And my cousin slows down for just a second. Who knows why? Maybe to comprehend what he's seeing. And I can tell you what they're wearing because we saw them very clearly. One with combat boots, the other with sneakers, blue jeans, cargo pants, black t-shirts, one with a tactical vest, the other without. Black balaclavas pulled over their face, carrying machine guns. We can see their eyes, that's how close we are to them. We see next to them in the car, because the doors are open. A man and a woman in the driver's seat, dead. Very obviously dead. We can see the blood, that's how clearly we see they're dead. One of the men, his back is to us and his hands, we can see his hands. They're the color red with blood. And one of the men, he raises his gun to us as we drive by, and my cousin slowed down, but he didn't stop. And as he slows down, and we are all seeing this at the same time, we're all losing our minds. We're telling him to drive now. Go, 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 drive. Sorry, sa, 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 sa. Don't stop. Go, Mordecai. The whole time. He raises his gun towards us, but he doesn't fire for whatever reason. Maybe it's because <coughs> he didn't stop completely. I don't know. That's not really relevant anymore. We drive by and we carry on, freaking out over what we just saw. Another silver car on the side of the road on the shoulder, 200 or so meters later. Trunk open, belongings all over the road. Maybe you've seen this video already. Left to right, one, two, three <coughs> bodies, three people. We have to drive around them the best we can. I say the best we can because we still ran one over. The next slide is a video of that scene. Don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. So now we're driving away, and we again, not even a kilometer or two later, we think we're approaching another checkpoint. It's not a checkpoint. They're not asking us where we're going, or where we're from, or who we are. They're not checking our car. This car closest to us pulls up next to us. We pull up next to it. We ask the soldiers, can we go through? We li we're living in Tel Aviv. This is one of the only few ways to Tel Aviv from where we were. We left a massacre. We left dozens. We passed dozens of bodies. We passed our men. Our friend, we saw people dead. Can we leave? Like, we go through. They said, no. Turn around. Go back. Back up. It's not safe. We ask why. They say there's terrorists hiding off in the bush somewhere. I look ahead of us. I look in between the other two IDF vehicles, and on the ground are two officers dead face down. We tell them we're not going back that way after what we just passed and saw. We have to go this way. Please let us through. They let us through. They say to go fast. We go fast. The whole time we're driving by in our little crappy four-door sedan, obviously not looking like soldiers. We think the whole time, wherever these terrorists are, they're going to see us as an easy target and they're going to peek their heads out to kill us. It doesn't happen. Driving back to Tel Aviv, passing more abandoned cars, more cars riddled with bullets. I text my brother, he's the first person I text. 
these first few texts are from during the festival. We were at the camps, escaping, the, waiting for the rockets to end. I send photos of Rand Schaefer and Aldea to remember their faces and their contact information so I could reach out to them after. And then I text him, I love you, I'm okay right now. Right now, because we were still on the road when I said that. Some of the following texts are, I'm safe now. My friends are missing. New friends I just made dead. Corpses everywhere. Eight of us went, four of us came back. One friend we just learned is okay. Three others unknown. I know people who were killed. I saw people with holes in their faces. He says, that's awful. I'm glad you're safe though. I have safe for now. It's not over. I say, my friends are missing. Again, eight of us went, four came back, one, we don't know where they are. We get back to my cousin's apartment in Tel Aviv. All of that, we got back to my cousin's apartment in Tel Aviv at 9.47 in the morning. We were so quick, people were still running for their lives. People were still being murdered, brutalized, burnt alive, fleeing. Their day wasn't over. They were still in the middle of it. But we were home safe, five of us. Our other three friends, Bara, Doraz, and Elmod, we had no idea where they were or what happened to them. Nothing. They're not answering our texts. They're not answering our calls. Not their friends' texts. Not their friends' calls. Not their parents' texts. Not their parents' calls. Nothing. Two hours pass, three hours pass, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's late at night now, we still have no idea. I don't know if it was very late that night or early the next morning that we learned they were okay. They had survived. <clears throat> so now we're getting the news nonstop. All our friends are coming to be with us. I'm texting people that I did get the phone numbers out, trying to find out if they're okay. Now we're learning the magnitude of the situation. Now that I know my friends who are immediately with me are okay, and we're not in danger anymore, I have a new concern. I'm concerned that all of the people I just made friends with at the festival have been murdered. <clears throat> and it's not like I had my photos on a digital camera. They were on film, so I can't even share them to social media right away. I have to wait until Monday to get them developed. I go down to LMB to get them developed. Rockets still happening, streets are dead. The store was closed, but they came to develop it just for me. Get my photos developed within four hours. Scan, upload to social media. Hey, have you seen these people? Do you know if they're okay? I met them at Supernova Festival. I took their photos, please. If you know them, send them my way. Send them my contact. Give me their contact. Let me know. And right away, I'm getting hundreds of messages. That's my brother, that's my sister, that's my son, that's my daughter, that's my cousin, that's my boyfriend, that's my girlfriend, that's me, I know them, so on and so forth. I'm learning whether or not these people are alive or dead. I learned Dor and his girlfriend Lali, they were okay. They had gone to the festival with some friends, Alex and Gilad. They got separated at one point from their friend Alex, who was kidnapped into Gaza, who they later learned was being held hostage, not by Hamas by some random people. No one has a clue where he is. They know it's not with Hamas. Dor, Lali, and Gilad fleeing in Dor's jeep. Gilad being shot in the head in the process. They flee to Kibbutz Bayri thinking they'd be safe, only to find out when they get there it's not safe. At one point they are forced to flee their jeep and they flee into Kibbutz Bayri and they hide in a public washroom while Dor is holding it shut with his own hands, Gilad bleeding out around them, where they spend the entire day there before they're rescued. But they are rescued, and even Gilad survives with the head wound. Not before they listened to the massacre and brutalization of the kibbutz citizens. I learned Shai was rescued, but unfortunately Dor was not. He was murdered on the festival ground. Jessica was rescued. She was rescued by a man 
in a white square van. He saved over 15 people, took them to a police station in Starot, where she personally told me she witnessed the arrest of six terrorists, and she told me some of these men looked our age. Jesse and Itamar also survived. They escaped. Shani survived as well. She fled in a car with some friends, not the ones pictured, different friends. They fled down that road, and three vans approached them, and men opened fire on their car, and they ducked down, and they sped past all of those men, shooting them actively, and they escaped. Noah, recently there was a video published by Hamas, and you see CCTV footage of Hamas executing some girls in the street, and in the background of this video, you see a white car, and out of the car somebody runs, and they trip, and they get up, and they continue to run, while Hamas is hundreds of meters away, less, executing people, chasing people. That's Noah. I learned from her that that was her, and that's where she was. Shani, Noah, and Ari all survived. Barak, Elmod, and my friend Doraz, we had no idea where they were. We learned very late at night or early the next morning that they were okay. They had hid in the woods. They fled in their car before being forced to leave it. Hid in a bush in the forest. Laying so still for so long while Hamas hunted people around them that Almog has nerve damage in her leg. Hamas so close to them, they could hear them talking. They could tell us how many men were around them, over ten. Their bush was moving. That's how close they were to Hamas. But they didn't find them, they survived. Itamar survived as well, but not before being shot twice and watching all of his friends get executed in front of him. Ori and Yvegni, they survived. Yvegni went right to his, middle of him, his military service that same week. Obeya was the first person I found to be alive. And we talk lots. Itay survived as well. In Israel, north of Tel Aviv, about 30 minutes or so, near Hetzalia, there is an event venue called the Bat Benit. Typically it's for weddings, but right now it is known as the Supernova Safe Zone, where anybody who is present at the festival can go there and meet people, find their friends, sit and relax, and just have a safe space to be. There's therapists of many kinds, there's sound therapy, there's art therapy, there's free food, there's massage therapy, and there's the therapy and support of one another. That's where I met Ute. And I spoke to him. One of the first things I asked him was, have you spoken to Hodeya? He says, what do you mean? I thought he thought she was dead. He didn't know she was alive. The whole time he thought she was dead. And this is, when I meet, when I meet Ute at the Vatranit, it's almost three weeks now since the festival. For three weeks, he thinks she's dead. I say, no, she's alive. I found her ages ago. I show her, I show him my WhatsApp conversation with her. I play her voice messages to me, and he's over the moon. I hug him. He's so happy that she's alive because he had no idea. My cousin Mordecai obviously survived. He was with me. Ren Schaefer, I learned he was not. He was murdered in the woods. I only learned what happened to him from his family. And that's when I also learned he has three kids in the family in Kibbutz Beiri. But I did not dare ask about whether or not they were okay in the off chance that they weren't. I didn't want to know that. Moti survived as well. He and a group of over 20 other people fled on foot to the site of Midburn, think burning man but in Israel, held in the same region as Supernova. It was being set up at the same time since it was supposed to be held within a two-week period after this attack. He was saved by the people of Minburn who were there setting up by pure chance. They saw him and this crowd of people running towards them, waving their arms and shouting, and they rescued them. They took them to safety. Moti came on that bus, like I mentioned before, driven by a Palestinian worker from Gaza. <coughs> and within the first week of the attack, Hamas put out a video of them capturing this man him telling them in Arabic he's Muslim, him telling them in Arabic he's from, he's from Gaza, him telling them in Arabic he's Palestinian, he has family in Gaza, and they still executed him. They still killed him after he verbally <coughs> told them who he is, where he's from. They didn't care. 
They made the conscious choice to murder this man. I even found Orr and his friend. They were okay. Not long after, actually on the 11th, I can tell you exactly when, I reach out to everybody I know. Whatever media contact you have, I want them. And for almost the whole month of October, almost every single day, I start doing interviews. ABC, CBC, BBC, MSNBC, Turkish outlets, Russian outlets, Italian outlets. Almost every single day, radio, TV, live, not live, written, sometimes six times a day, for almost the whole month of October. One of these interviews, I did the CNN, and I went back to the festival site. I come from over there. Yeah. Don't, wait, over wait, wait till the camera's on. So yeah, yeah, I, I will show you, I will speak about it 200,000 yeah. times. We later visited Kibbutz Bayri as well, where I saw what happened there. The festival ground was an alien world. It was not the same place I was early morning on the 7th, with all the lights and the joy. The trees riddled with bullets, covered in blood, tents covered in blood, bullets all over the ground, people's belongings all over the place, the bar riddled with bullets, soaked in blood. You could see where people died. You could see handprints on trees. You could see handprints on signs and tents, tents cut open with knives. It was not a war zone because that means people were fighting each other. This was a massacre. Given all of that, the festival of 3,500 people present, 364 were murdered, 40 were kidnapped, and of all the people I met and photographed personally, only those two had been murdered. I found every single person after the fact, and I've seen them all, and I've hugged them all, and I've spoken to them all, and I tell them all how glad I am that I met them, and how glad I am that they're okay. I always think to myself, you know, what if this, what if that? Every decision that we did or didn't make contributed to us not dying. Like if I hadn't decided to buy a ticket, if I decided to stay because it was going to be boring, maybe my friends would have stayed and died. Because like you heard, it's safe, there's no danger, there's no rush, they're not shooting at us. They wanted to wait for the traffic and wait for the rockets to end. But my anxious ass didn't let them. Maybe if we took a different road, or if we decided to make that U-turn and follow those other people, this, that, this, that, all of it contributed to, to us not having been killed, part of that number, not having been kidnapped, part of that number. And all of these people as well. Okay. With their friends, with their family. With support. I can tell you for certain, almost every single one of them has at least one therapist. I have three. And no one's paying for anything. That's all paid for by donations and different fundraisers and the government, so on and so forth. Events like this leave an incredibly long lasting impact on those impacted directly, on those who know somebody who was murdered, on those who know somebody who was killed kidnapped, on those who were there and saw it themselves, it leaves an impact on those who weren't there, who didn't witness any of these things, but their friends were, or their family was. It leaves an impact on the community abroad, on the Jewish community abroad. Every time I go to one of these places, whether it's University of Boston, or Berkeley, or Davis, or UCLA, or some synagogue, or JCC, whether it's in the US or Canada, and I see the people who come to give me their attention, to hear what I have to say, to hear what I have to show, to give me their support, not just to myself, but to all of these people who are OK, it means everything to me. It means the world to me. Because right now, that's one of the best things you can do, that's one of the best ways you can help, is to give people your support and to make it known.
and to make it known that you are aware of what happened and you understand and you can empathize. You don't have to give financially. You can, and there's many ways you can that have no affiliation with government whatsoever. No affiliation with the IGF. You can donate toys for kids, you can donate goods for displaced families, you can donate that contributes to people's mental health care like myself and my friends. You can go on missions abroad to help harvest the crops that were abandoned or help volunteer with children or whatever. Lots of ways you can help and be productive from there or here. Your choice. And it means everything to me, whatever your choice is. It means everything to these people, it means everything to my friends, everybody in Israel. You know, many people who are at the festival, they say they feel alone, like nobody cares about them. Like they don't have support from the outside, just each other and themselves, and that's it. And so I always share with them how many people come to see and hear our experience, whether it's a group of 50 or 15 or 500, Jews or non-Jews, Boston University, almost non-Jews, all of them, they're always shocked to hear it because they couldn't even imagine that people would care. They think it's just likes and social media and comments and then it's out of their lives when the phone is down. Disconnected. So that's why I'm here. I'm here to remove that disconnect. I'm here, having been there, having refused, having said no to two rescue flights back to Canada, because I didn't want to leave my friends and my family. End of October comes, I stop getting interviews. I think, great, how am I, what am I going to do now? How can I help? And then I'm approached with this opportunity by these two Israeli entrepreneurs with a project. that They call it Faces of October 7th. They want to bring survivors like myself to the festival, to North America, to different campuses, to different communities, to share their experiences with those people, to remove the disconnect created by social media and just seeing it on TV. And I said yes. Before they even told me it would entail leaving the country, I said yes. They said, Shy, I have this project. Are you interested? I said yes. Before they even said it would require me to leave. And I did leave. I actually left with a two days notice. They told me one day, and then they're like, oh, okay, it's on Thursday. I'm like, oh, it's Tuesday. Okay, sure. I packed up and I went. And it's hard for me. It's hard for me being here, away from the people I love, while they're still being bombed, while I still have to run to the bunker and hide for that 15 minute period. But I'm incredibly grateful to have this opportunity, this thing that I've been doing since the 5th of November. A new campus, a new city, a new school, a new community center almost every single day. More flights than I can count on both hands. It's exhausting. I'm saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over. It's physically exhausting immensely exhausting, but I'm happy to share it a million times if need be, because I feel it's incredibly necessary. Not sharing is not optional in my opinion, and I'm happy to. And when I see the support we get, it makes it feel like it's worth it. Because it seems like there's enormous amounts of anti-Semitism. It, it seems, it seems, seems, like there's a new wave of anti-Semitism. New people hate us on top of the old people that hate us, which is not the case. It's not a new thing. They're just comfortable sharing it now. Feelings that have already existed are now okay to let out because the guy next to them said the same thing they're thinking. But I can see in my own eyes that we have more support than there is hate. More people are giving us their love and support in numerous different ways than there are people saying, you deserve to die because of where you live. My family has lived there for 10 generations. So my friends, longer. So seeing all of this support makes it easy to brush off all the hate, ignore it waste their breath, waste their time tearing down posters or chanting stupid slogans. It's okay. 
good. It feels good to support something. When you support something you're passionate about, it feels good. You get that serotonin boost, like when you get an Instagram post that gets a thousand likes or whatever. It feels the same. It feels good to support somebody who feels being wronged. It feels good to support something that aligns with your values. But being passionate about something and being loud about something and supporting something with all your heart doesn't change reality. It doesn't change the reality of my friends back home. It doesn't change my friend, my friend's reality, who's had seven members of her family kidnapped into Gaza and the rest killed. Their reality hasn't changed. They know what happened. They're living it every single day. They have three family members released in the second hospital deal, but the rest are still in Gaza somewhere. Here you can see on the right, there's the Instagram of this project. You can see the other survivors who are in North America traveling around doing the same as me. Mine is in the bottom where there's other videos that you have not seen. And if you want to donate to the project to help it keep going so I can go to other places, you can do that, but it's not necessary. You don't have to. And I appreciate every single one of you for being here and giving me your time and your attention and your support because it means absolutely everything to me. It means more to me now than anything. 